this is mind blowing. This like quality of life that I didn't know existed to me just opened up. And I, you know, thinking about it, like just sort of just makes me a little emotional just because never before in my life had I experienced that. And so that's when I started to think of, okay, well, there are definitely some benefits to this. Obviously with any drug, there's always going to be side effects, potential side effects and other things to consider. And so I really wanted to do my due diligence and, and kind of read up and make sure that I'm not missing the boat on anything. My guest today is Dr. Crystal Guevara. She is an actual doctor and she's rad. You can find her on Instagram at dr.crystal. Please enjoy. Dr. Crystal Guevara, welcome to the American Glutton Podcast. And fucking good to see you after so long. Oh my God. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been so long since I've uh, chatted with you. Uh, We're just talking. It's been four years. We were, I feel like the last time I saw you, we were, there was an eating challenge at your house in Las Vegas. (laughs) And and it wasn't even such exciting food. It wasn't like Nathan's hot dogs or pizza or anything like that. It was like healthy rice and fish dishes yeah wow yeah that actually just ha- i just realized the the sushi bowl like thing so yeah yeah uh, <laughs> so it's been a while it we, has we, been we, yeah we have we have both progressed in our lives four yeah. years of progression oh my gosh yes i can't believe time flies when you're having fun yes that's true um okay i you are a doctor when i yes. saw you you were doing your residency is that correct uh my uh my sports medicine fellowship so i had just finished my residency in family medicine in pennsylvania and then we hopped in a minivan with whatever we could stuff it with drove across the country during the covid pandemic to vegas uh to start my one-year fellowship in sports medicine yeah and how and so you that well one year you're done you're a full blown, you're, I don't know how you say it, board certified. Is that a thing? Yeah. uh, They make you pay a lot of money and then answer some multiple choice questions. And then you, you know, if you pass, they call you board certified. So technically, yes, I am a board certified family medicine physician and then have a certificate of added qualifications in sports medicine. That's just such a mouthful. (laughs) It's a mouthful, but you're like a full blown doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Which is like crazy to think about like, oh, I'm done. Like it's been, you know, a decade of, you know, learning and just like, oh, here you are. Have a nice day. See yeah. you. See you never. <laughs> and, and I just want to be sure I'm thinking with this correctly. Yeah. Family medicine. That's like somebody I would just go and see and my kids would see. That's not, mm-hmm. you're not, that's not uh, specifically for chick stuff. That's not family planning. Like you're not an OG I, OB, you know, OB, 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 you, yeah. you do a little, the, the nice thing about family medicine is you get to do a little bit of everything. So yeah, you can have a baby come in for a well check. You can come in for, you know, general physical, uh, your grandmother could come in, um, you know, for some geriatric care and some concerns. And so you go from womb to tomb as we, uh, in family medicine say it. And so everything in between, so yeah. kind of seen a little bit of everything. Yeah. Okay, radical. Let's fucking dig in, Doctor Crystal. Like I want to present all of the the all of the sides that could represent my point of view, but uh-huh. um, or my points of view, which I'm not yeah. rigid on anything yeah. really. I'm very open, but like yeah. my my wife, um, she had friends who had kids who she felt had adverse reactions to vaccines many yeah. years ago. So yeah. my wife was not an anti-vaxxer kind of in the way that I think of like Robert Kennedy, but she mm-hmm. was vaccine skeptical yeah. and I was very much not. I was very uh-huh. much like, no, there's shit out there that can harm our kids. And I yeah. would prefer whatever risk is involved in this vaccine. I think like, tetanus is a worse risk and polio is a worse risk. I'm, I'm not, I'm, you know, I grew up with chicken pox being yeah. like a, a party we went to as yeah. a little kid. And so Same I wasn't here. so worried about chicken pox and even, um, 
measles i remember measles being highly treatable as a kid mm -hmm. and there was no fear so those were less worrisome to me and then we had a kid with type 1 diabetes at four mm -hmm. and i was like we're, this kid is getting fucking vaccinated because mm -hmm. she had a higher compromisation so yeah I grew I grew up, my parents were hippies. There was some skepticism of pharmacology and medicine. And then my kid's life is saved every day, multiple times a day by pharmaceuticals. And so that kind of <laughs> fractured my thinking on it a little bit where I was like, yeah. oh, Pfizer is not so bad. They're saving yeah. my kid's life every single day. It might be Lily, whoever makes Novolog saves my kid's life every day. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm grateful yeah. to them. And I, and I like, Hope they keep saving lives. Um, yeah. And then the magic fucking weight loss drugs happen. <laughs> and, and like, again, for me, I was a kid who grew up and was put on uh, Fenfen for a short oh, period of time. Yeah. And uh, then very quickly taken off of it because I, I stopped sleeping. And my yeah. mom was like, well... You can, we're, you know, we're going to, yeah. you're going to sleep. I'd rather you sleep. And she was also skeptical of um, pharmacology. And, and so I have a thousand, you know, conflicting feelings about oh. all of this, but I want to yeah. talk to you. You're a doctor. And, yeah. and like, at the end of the day, I think like, I didn't want to have bariatric surgery, mm -hmm, though mm -hmm. that was certainly an option for me at one point. Yeah. Um, but I think that probably more than anything, I didn't want to do it because I was scared of the operation. Mm -hmm. um, and there was also this caveat that you like have to diet in order to get the operation. And I was like, well, if I'm going to do that, I'm just going to keep going. Like this was yeah. my thought, but then I, yeah. But then I wouldn't do any of it. And then when I finally started dieting, I was like, oh, I can lose weight. But I gained weight yeah. back. But I can lose weight, you know. Yeah. Um, and then your husband was very, but we should say for the people, I don't know if you you don't want his shine on you. but you Oh, know. no, I mean, let's shine away. I, I don't, uh, I have no, you know, um, you know, uh, I... Either way, I'm all about uh, transparency. So I am yeah. married to Dr. Mike Isretel. The <laughs> fucking legend himself. Um, and his TED talk really mm -hmm. changed my perception. You know, I think it was more so that for, I guess, 15 years at that point, I had kind of dug my heels into fad diets and gone like, whatever the various fad diet was, this is truth. And this will get me to the promised land. And then they never did. Yeah. And then just the way his TED talk, which I, which I watched um initially with like a, a kind of a gape and then rewatched it immediately as like a hate watch like mm -hmm. fuck this guy he's wrong and then i watched it like a third time going like what if he has a point might as well try his method and then i found it to be very workable i think there's so much more that goes into personally the psychology of why i'm doing what i'm doing with food mm -hmm. than any structure so the structure mm -hmm. i found was incredibly helpful but then it there was like more i had to figure out for like you know like i'm just avoiding discomfort that's why i'm eating and that's a big part of like me today listen if there was a magical weight loss drug that came on the scene five or six years ago in the way that it did a year and a half ago mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm i'd be on it that mm -hmm. would have been and and i would have yeah. stopped thinking you know, because I'll try anything. I'm like, yeah. you know, I did a diet 10 years ago called um, uh, HCG mm -hmm. where you mm -hmm. eat 500 calories a day and you get a shot. And, you know, I lost 30 or 40 pounds in a month and then the diet's right. over and then I gained the weight back. And it was <laughs> just like, I don't know what's happening, but I lost right. 30 or 40 pounds. It much must be the shot they're giving me. Well, but I was also eating 500, 500 calories. calories. Yeah. yeah. So my fear with the magical weight loss drug is yeah. I guess that people start growing third arms. There's certainly that fear, right? Which we, which seems unlikely because they've been being used for now. Mm -hmm. I think last I read 17 or 18 years in some form, these, uh, 20, almost 20, almost 20 years. So, yeah. and nobody's yeah. grown a third yard. So that yeah. a third that's arm, so that's <laughs> unlikely. 
And then my other thought is like for gals like my wife and her friends and her friend group who their struggle with weight loss, which has been consistently ongoing in the same, in the same way mine has, but on a much smaller scale where it's like, um, a five to 15 to 20 pound desire to lose mm -hmm. weight. And they do every fad diet over and over again. And then the weight comes back and we have these conversations where it's like, well, yeah. you know, it produces weight loss. The weight comes back. Why are you still doing that? And it's like, well, because it produced weight loss, <laughs> you know? And so if they get on these peptides, does it, will it not just assist in making those fad diets easier? And, and maybe the answer is yes. And like cocaine was invented for nasal surgery and as an, a, a numbing <laughs> agent. And yeah. like now it's largely used as something else. And like, that doesn't mean we get rid of Novocaine, you know? Right. Right. Okay. I've said yeah. all my, no, you no, know. that's, that's a whole, that's a whole lot of stuff to, to unpack. I mean, you know, I, I would be lying if I said that I didn't also like, it's weird being on both sides of the equation where I am a physician and I do prescribe these medications and I work with patients in building those habits and trying to figure out what, you know, what can we work on in the short term, the long term, the medium long term, um, and then on the other hand, I am also a patient, like I am also somebody who has definitely benefited from this, but it didn't come as like, once the, you know, once my physician was like, you know, Hey, there's these new drugs out, like you should look into it. I was scared. I actually put it off for a very long time. And I'm not sure if I, I Mike ever spoke to this cause we're pretty open with each other. It really wasn't until I started noticing how food focused and how hungry he was with his own self-imposed bodybuilding prep and thinking about the the level hunger levels and the food noise, as they call it. And, and then I really started to think, well, you know, the my entire life has always been like just this raging amount of hunger, no matter whether it's five pounds, whether it's 10 pounds. Um, you know, I would end the diet and my hunger would be so out of control that no amount of dry chicken breast and broccoli could satiate me. Like my stomach would literally just be bloated and out to here and I would be hurting, but like my so brain, hungry. my yeah. brain is like, give me food. Um, no, and, that, by the way, I think <laughs> that is the thing that anybody who's ever been on a diet can relate to. Because, you know, even talking about like making healthier choices, you substitute celery sticks for Doritos. And it, and and I know exactly what you're saying. I can yeah. eat a head of celery sticks and be utter like there's no room whatsoever. Yeah. And I'm still thinking about food. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. And and that wasn't until uh, 20 January 2022 that I was like, OK, well, fine. I have taken other medications in the past. Uh bupropion, uh, Contrave, which is naltrexone, the combination with naltrexone, which is also used in, uh, um, I believe, either alcohol um, addiction or opioid addiction, um, which gave me a, an adverse reaction. I broke out into hives. Um, I've used, um, been prescribed uh, Topamax, which is used for migraine prevention. Um, so I'm no stranger to pharmacology, but for some reason, this uh, semaglutide kind of injection, uh, I don't know, uh, all these sorts of things were kind of swimming in my head. And I was like, I, I can't like, let me just get through fellowship and then let me come back to this with a clear mind. So it took me about uh, two years to sort of give it some thought. And finally, I was like, you know what? I'm almost 40 years old. I've been hungry my entire life for as long as I can remember. It was not society. It was not like peer pressure or whatever. I have always just been the girl who has finished her plate, who, you know, the clean plate club, the shining example of eating all of your food. <laughs> um, let me give this a shot and let's see where this goes. Um, and to my huge surprise, uh, the these obsessive thoughts that I had just sort of went away. And I remember sitting, went out to dinner with Mike and we were just at a restaurant. I had a, you know, a filet mignon, no extra butter, had some, um, you know, a side of broccoli. I had some mashed potatoes. I had a glass of wine and we had some appetizers. And I just remember being able to enjoy the conversation that I was having with Mike and not thinking about, 
at this point, I would just be starving. I probably would have guzzled the entire glass of wine. I would have, you know, the amount of psych psychological bandwidth that I would have to be mindful of like, oh, I have to drink a glass of water. I have to chew my own food thoroughly. I have to like make sure to have a bite of the broccoli and then have a glass of water. And then, you know, just so I don't like stuff myself like a raving lunatic. And I'm just like, oh, is this what thin people feel like this, what comes so naturally, like, oh, you know, I'm just not hungry. I can just chat with my friends and like, you know, I can eat in between the conversation and just remember thinking like, wow, this is just, this is mind blowing. This like quality of life that I didn't know existed to me just opened up. And I, uh, you know, thinking about it, like just sort of just makes me a little emotional just because I, never before in my life had I experienced that. And so that's when I started to think of, okay, well, there are definitely some benefits to this. Um, you know, obviously with any drug, there's always going to be side effects, potential side effects and other things to consider. And so, um, you know, I, I really wanted to do my due diligence and, and kind of read up and make sure that I'm not missing the boat on anything. Like, am I going to, you know, get a third arm? Am I going to, you know, have low blood sugar? Am I going to, and then you see all these other sensational headlines of, you know, your stomach's going to be paralyzed if you eat the, you know, right. if you do this. So the, and there was one that yeah. was a blindness recently. There was, you there know? was. So, and the thing about, uh, the thing about news, this isn't anything new, how they sort of sensationalize what's actually going on. I was actually just rereading that uh, blindness study and um, very interesting because the other things before the GLP ones even came to, to uh, you know, to the market, uh, the things that can cause that particular type of blindness are there's an, they actually don't know the full mechanism. So, but they do know that there's a very strong association with, uh, people who have obesity, people with type two diabetes, uh, people with high blood pressure, people with sleep apnea. So it's very hard to say, and we use these drugs to treat obesity. Type right. 2 so diabetes. you're going into it with a lot of the markers leaning. Yeah. It's, it's a crazy, no, but even, Type one diabetes, um, mm -hmm. my kid has to get her eyes checked mm -hmm. multiple times a year because of specifically because, you know, she has to see a special heart. Like yeah. I go to get my eyes checked. I look in a thing and they say, read the top line. And no, she has to go to some yeah. gnarly doctor because the excess blood sugar can affect some nerve, which mm -hmm. just isn't going to happen for me. So right. When, yeah, when I, listen, I'm headline, I'm very headline skeptical. Um, but when I dig into it, mm -hmm. I, I tend to find more positive benefits, you yeah. know, like, um, the, the reduced, uh, risk of heart disease, which, yeah. which is even presents prior to weight loss, yeah. which is surprising. Um, a, a reduction in, um, inflammation is mm -hmm. an associated thing, which also presents mm -hmm. prior to weight loss. So it's, mm -hmm. so like, I would understand like, yeah, if you lose weight, then you're at less of a risk for heart disease. Or if you lose weight, you're at your inflammation mm -hmm. would likely go down. But these are presenting just because the people started taking these peptides, which to me is surprising. And that's, you know, listen, in fairness, I don't, I'm not a, I didn't graduate from high school, so I don't really know how to read these papers in the way that you or your husband or other guys who have PhDs mm -hmm. know how to read them. Mm -hmm. But it seems to be what they're saying. And when I read a headline that says somebody went blind and then you read that the guy who went blind had type 2 diabetes, was obese, didn't sleep well and yeah. started taking this and went blind. It's like that's that's likely not caused by the drug. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, cause these, uh, these don't just sort of come out, um, come out of the woodwork. And I, and the reason why you do start these, uh, these eye checkups so frequently, even when you first get diagnosed is because it takes a long time, uh, you know, for, um, you know, uh, blindness to develop kind of nerve problems to develop, um, and, and so forth. So you're not going to, you know, like, ah, I just shot, you know, some aglutide, like, ah, I'm blind now. Like the, you know. <laughs> yeah. The the other thing you, you mentioned, which is really fascinating and interesting for me mm -hmm. is like, I've, 
I, I've had, I had, to, I'm a sober person. I've been sober mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. a very long time. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. sobriety for me is abstinence from drugs and alcohol. Yeah. And even, and, and I will say like that noise, that kind of auxiliary yeah. noise right. that drugs played in my yeah. life in the beginning of sobriety, it was chaos. It was like every single day, most of the day, yeah my mind is going to how drugs would improve my experience. And today, many years later, that's not my um, experience. It's gotten much less. I'm not saying that I feel that I'm out of the woods because I don't believe yeah. that that's going to happen for me. Okay. But yeah. that noise has has subsided. Um, I I do not believe, and and this is where I would kind of liken my experience to food or equate yeah. it to food, yeah. which is had I, in order to survive, it, mm -hmm. if I had to drink um, a glass of wine throughout yeah. the course of a day, I don't know that that noise would get as quiet as it's gotten. And so with food, mm -hmm. I know exactly what you're saying. Like, mm -hmm. I don't have to measure my food today, but I have to actively look at it and be honest with myself, yeah. you know, and if I'm using an oil, I, I yeah. measure the oil. I don't okay. eyeball oil. Yeah. And I still think about food quite a bit because, yeah. Yeah. you know, I know what it's like to eat a meal and still be thinking about food. Mm -hmm. um, it's much harder when I'm dieting than when I'm yeah. maintaining. Maintenance seems to chill it out a little bit, but there is still like, you know, my kids aren't on diets and if they want to eat pizza i have um some portion of my attention fixated on that pizza and it's just a conversation and so you're saying that dies that's gone away it, it um i I, w I was actually think i'm glad you brought up the maintenance part because like every time i've tried to go on to maintenance it has been a disaster it has been a complete and utter disaster um, to the point where actually Mike even created some sort of evening hunger templates like seven or eight years ago to try because he never saw somebody who could eat as much as I do or just have this like he's he like later told me that I have this look on my face post diet where it's like nothing glazed eyes like nothing I can do I'm just eating mindlessly or at least according to him and he's like and he's like that's when I knew that you know we're the scale's gonna go up uh you know and it, it would always just make him sad because you know of how much I wanted this to work and I just couldn't make like you're married. Like I get a lot of comments where like, you're married to Dr. Mike. It should be so easy for you to like be in shape. And I'm like, you don't know me. Yeah. <laughs> Just so, um, but yeah, the, um, I still, uh, you know, uh, I still have a little bit of, you know, um, food focus, particularly with dieting, particularly with this last diet. Um, but the intensity has definitely died down quite a bit, but it's right. still there in varying degrees, but it is just manageable that I can actually get through my day. I'm not biting on my nails, praying for the next meal to happen. Um, you know, I can have, you know, work calls where I'm actually paying attention. Like my whole day would just be completely shot in like a four hour period because I would eat my entire day's worth of meals in like a, you know, a four hour period. And then just hope that like, that would be enough calories for me to survive my job, which, you know, uh, which is why I put dieting on the table off the table for a number of years. Cause like, I can't do that to patients. Like that's just unfair. Like I, heaven forbid something happened because I was too busy thinking about how hungry I was. And, you know, uh, Joe Smith is over there having a heart attack and I'm like, I'm hungry. I, I never wanted that to happen. So. <laughs> yeah, it really does seem like, you know, um, talk to, uh, if I, if I dig into like the, and again, I could be getting it all wrong, but like, I, this is another thing, like gr growing up the way I did and being on a diet so much and rebelling against that and trying to clobber together some narrative for myself that made it make sense. Yeah. You know, there was like this idea that I didn't understand what hunger cues were. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that like maybe I was behaving more on the hedonic pathway 
and like, because like, if I think about getting to 500 pounds, I don't think that that was all hunger. Do you, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? I think yeah. there were other yeah. mechanisms there. And there was one where it was like yeah. a, a, a lot of um, my compulsions and habits where I a learned behavior of like, I can comfort myself with food. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to keep doing that. Um, and then this idea of like, okay, marketing of food or availability of food is playing a role in it too. Yeah. And my genetics are playing a role. And, and now I have this quagmire of environment and genetics and predisposition and learned habits and all yeah. of it. Um, so it is fascinating to me that, that, that just the volume of all of that can get turned down, you know, hunger. I feel like I can white knuckle hunger, actual hunger, what I recognize yeah. as like a grumbling stomach. Right, right. But there, there is kind of like the thought pattern that I experience that mm -hmm. is what I'm mostly dealing with now. Yeah. Um, and it's fascinating to me that you, that that can get turned down. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I guess with when, and these are all like really awesome conversations to have, cause there's not, you know, it seems like you've done a lot of great things with just being able to control it on your own, which is awesome. Um, I guess my question is like, has, uh, has that affected work? Has that affected, like, do you, like, even in, during maintenance, like, do you find, you said that it really helped, you know, kind of like turn down sort of the food focus and the hunger and stuff like that. It seems like your maintenance periods have been really successful though, at like in maintaining your weight and not necessarily like climbing back up to the original, your original starting point. Am I correct in that? Oh yeah. Maintenance yeah. to me is a game changer, but, but it wasn't at first. It certainly, mm -hmm. it was the, it was way harder, but I think it was way harder also because I had such a strong desire because I wasn't at a place where I was comfortable, you know, that, mm -hmm. but that's another thing that I've gotten pretty good at, which is on any given day at any given weight, I can get mm -hmm. on the scale or look at myself in the mirror and be completely disappointed at my leanest. I can be disappointed. And so getting yeah. happy with this idea of nothing, nothing is going to satisfy me permanently. And so mm -hmm. every day is a new day and a new shot at living my life in the way that I feel better about, you know, um, yeah. that has helped me because I'm prepared now to wake up and go like, you're a fat piece of shit, even though I'm at like 14% body fat, you, yeah. you know what I mean? And so yeah. like, this is cognitive dissonance. This is, yeah. this feeling is emotional. It's irrational. I got to get happy with 14% body fat because that's a perfectly fine weight to maintain. That's a good long-term weight, whatever I am. You know, there's a there's been lately a little bit of thought of like, I'm 260 pounds today and 260 pounds, you know, getting into my 70s, do I really want to be 260? So this has been my yeah. thought lately. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not in my 60s now. I'm not even in my <laughs> 50s yet. So like, I'm thinking down the line, but yeah. like- there is kind of a thought of like, wouldn't 240 be a better, a healthier weight just because I'm moving around less mass. So, yeah. but today at yeah. the body fat percentage I'm at and I'm not hyper fixated on anything. I'm not yeah. hyper fixated on, you know, am I killing myself in the gym or am I, you know, getting my, my maintenance now is very loose, yeah. uh, you know? Um, but when I began, it was hard because I wasn't seeing any progression, yeah. any perceivable progression. Um, I wasn't able to pat myself on the back yet for maintaining my weight. Maintaining my weight felt like a failure at first. And I had to mm -hmm. really talk myself out of that. Yeah, no, I have, I have, uh, patients who, uh, working on building those habits. And so, you know, I try and do my best to point out that, yes, we are purposely maintaining your weight at a, a place that you don't like. And I understand that, but let's pull out the pictures. You know, you also have gone to the gym four times a week for the last 12 weeks. That's 
awesome. Like, when have you done that in the past? And you are now starting to learn about macronutrients and really thinking about protein and vegetables and incorporating fruits into your diets. You've like just all those non-scale victories. Um, yeah, I, I remind uh, one particular patient of mine who had undergone bariatric surgery and um, was, I, I had read the kind of uh, maintenance plan um, from the bariatric surgeon. And I just, you know, was incredibly livid at how little, um, I was like, you were set up to fail. Like yeah. you were set up to fail. Like stay on 800 calories as long as you can is not a maintenance plan. That is absolutely, like you are asking your patients to fail and they're going to feel miserable. And so I, you know, trying to work on, on those habit, um, habits with her, um, you know, uh, you know, being in that spot where you're incredibly disappointed because you want to see a lower number, but um, being able to provide like, hey, there's all these other awesome things. And what we're doing is we're setting you up for success in the long term. Like this isn't a short term thing and we're going to work together and you're doing great. So just keep at it. This is a year's progress, you know, year's timeline and not necessarily a 30 day, you know, bad diet type of timeline. So, and I think that helps 100%. I mean, but the point you make is an incredible yeah. point because every maintenance I did on, you know, maintenance on mm -hmm. any diet, fad diet I had done prior, the maintenance was not a forever plan. Mm -hmm. It was always, it because like 800 calories a day, you die of starvation. <laughs> if yeah. that's your forever plan, that's, yeah. That's not, it cannot be like a little kid needs more than 800 yeah. calories a day. Um, and so that was my experience. My experience yeah. with quote unquote maintenance had always been just some transition period where you're still in a severe caloric deficit. You're still dieting. Yeah. Um, so this version of maintenance, which your husband really opened my eyes to, which was incredibly hard for all the reasons we talked mm -hmm. about, um, in fact, it seemed harder because I'm not losing weight. And, mm -hmm. you know, it really is at that point perspective um, of like, what do I want out of this? Am I working on a plan that is a forever plan? And and if forever is that I hope to get to a weight I'm satisfied with, which still isn't true. You know, I did that cut with Jared and, and your husband and Mike mm -hmm. and even on that day where I was like single digit body fat yeah, percentage, yeah. I had done a water thing. I was like, so in the best, you know, look I could possibly be in quad separation, all this shit. Yeah. And I was still like, what if I could get another pound of fat off? You know what I mean? Oh man. Um, oh man. <laughs> yeah. Which is madness. Um, And so like, I, I really do think that, getting your mind around these things is is right and then like the people i've talked to who have had bariatric surgery i think one for one said that the first surgery is always with the expectation that you're going to get another surgery down the line so what yeah and um one guy who you know, you get the surgery, you're going to lose a lot of weight, then you're going to start eating and you're going to need another surgery. Um, and I know one guy who became obsessed with the gym and learning macros, and that's what yeah. he's doing. And he seems to be doing well. And then another guy who opted for, I believe, Ozempic over yeah. another surgery and is doing well and maintaining his weight that way. And yeah. I, like, I, I mean, if, if all things are equal, I'd rather get a shot than a surgery, you yeah. know, if that's the, if those are the trade-offs and from what I'm hearing, um, there's a drug that's being, um, tested right now. I'm going to blank on the name of it, but I think it's RRR or triple R or something like that. that uh, retatratide, something the triple like agonist, that. the triple, triple agonist. agonist. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and that supposedly has shows results that are equal to bariatric surgery. So they're going to put bariatric surgeons out of business with something like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, there's still, I guess there's always still going to be huge skeptics, um, of, of the medication. Uh, you know, I'm trying to think of like where, you know, 
whether or not it's going to be completely out of business or, or whatnot, but it'll definitely be interesting to see how that landscape changes because, you know, right now bariatric surgery is, you know, pretty high demand. Uh, there's plenty of people who are, who want it, who, and, and need it. Uh, and, you know, we'll sort of go from there, but yeah, the downtime of, you know, just making some anatomic alterations to your, you know, uh, the inside anatomy going in and being cut up, uh, you know, always comes with some risk. And then even afterwards, um, and then the plan, the diet plan afterwards, you have to do like liquids and then, you know, pureed solids, like it's a, you know, it's a whole thing. It's not just like, oh, you know, I'm going to take, you know, a shot once a week and then, you know, work on my habits. You know, it's a like, the surgery, the post-surgery, and then you transition into this ma maintenance or like whatnot. And I've just seen so many varying degrees. I don't mean to shit on all, uh, you know, people who get bariatric surgery. Oh. Um, you know, uh, there's varying degrees of how they set up their client or their patients for success after the surgery. So, um, yeah, I, it could, you know, I'm always of the opinion that uh, if you are, you know, really interested and you qualify for bariatric surgery and you are okay with that plan and the risks and the, you know, the benefits of, of it, then, you know, uh, go for it. I am not one of those people that's like, Oh, don't do this. Like you should rather really, you know, think about this, but, um, just having that nuanced discussion is always super helpful. Yeah. Do you find, um, culturally or socially or in you know a lot of this is not my experience in real life talking to people but it's mm -hmm. uh the experience i see on social media which is like mm -hmm. you know my um peephole into what i perceive to be like the social experience yeah. um yeah. there there does seem to be a lot of like just you know it, but 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 I think this way with anything, why isn't somebody and it's even directed at me as a mm -hmm. like a a spokesperson for being tough, which I don't feel that I'm tough. I feel like I failed my way into a successful pattern, um, but it took me 20 years. Yeah. You know what I mean? And like, I don't think everybody has 20 years necessarily or right. is going to be able to figure out something in the same way, like because I do think every experience is so unique, but I I, I guess I see people getting shit on left and right mm -hmm. for using these GLP ones. Um, and, and I don't like it. I don't like it yeah. in the same way that I don't like seeing somebody who got bariatric surgery shit on yeah. because I, I go like, dude, I, I, I tried, I, I did the one thing I didn't try that was available to me was bariatric surgery. Cause I was fucking scared. Yeah. Like it's got nothing to do with me being tough. I didn't yeah. do that because I was scared of it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I see, a, uh, I think a little bit less. So I think the algorithm, social media algorithm is nice in that, um, if you don't, uh, you can curate your experiences. Um, so, um, I, I, you know, admittedly I was pretty damn scared for the first year. I didn't want people to know just because I didn't, um, uh, didn't want to deal with the backlash. And also like, I just wasn't in a place emotionally where I, you know, if I do have people who pop off at the mouth, like I'd be able to brush it off. But, um, nowadays it's, you know, um, overall I had, I personally haven't gotten too many, um, comments uh and the comments that i have gotten it's just like they're from anonymous you know uh accounts with no profile picture no whatever and it's like okay whatever you you're not a real person right. um so uh i don't you know take them seriously and uh the other thing that i've also noticed on social media is i think there was also a huge fear with the f online fitness community that this was somehow going to magically put them out of business and um, I, you know, I think it's anything, but I think more now more than ever, we do need the fitness community just because I think the things that I have learned about nutrition, about, um, a caloric deficit, about being, uh, a, a eucaloric in a maintenance period. I, I can't, I thought I was the last person to figure out that, um, I was all under the impression for a very long time that whatever calories you ended on, on a deficit those were going to be your maintenance calories. <laughs> so you I, just keep going. 
Well, I mean, like you just stay there, right? Like you don't cut anymore, but you just stay there. And uh, it wasn't until, uh, yeah, I came across uh, Mike's book, uh, which I bought um, when we first started dating, kind of read through it. And I was like, oh, oh, no way. This is how this works. Like you actually purposely and like reverse dieting started to kind of come out on my Instagram algorithm. I was like, oh, oh, wow. I feel like an idiot. And, you know, still do quite often with many other things. But um, I still see that sort of narrative being played around in um, in uh, kind of online chats uh, amongst medical professionals. So, you know, um, which makes me sad. There needs to be a better link between, you know, online fitness space and medical professionals. So I've tried to kind of bridge that gap and try and give um, fitness professionals sort of like tips on how to approach a physician. Like, Hey, these are my services. I would love to work with you. I know that you, you know, your med spa, like, you know, prescribes uh, these weight loss drugs. I would love to be able to implement, you know, a training plan and a nutrition plan that kind of helps like, um, and also just kind of connecting, uh, also personal trainers to some of my physician colleagues, like, Hey, this person's in the area. They're really awesome. You should consider referring people to them. You know, if you need specifics on how to train, because we physicians give some really generic advice. Like if I didn't know Mike and I wasn't in that space, I, I couldn't tell you how to start a training plan, like re resistance training. Like you get a whole wide variety of responses like, Oh, Oh, just eat plants. And you're like, that, that's not helpful. Right. Um, French fries are plants. Right. Like, uh, you know, uh, a vegan diet is best, but it's like, you know, uh, people joke about how Oreos are vegan or whatever. So. <laughs> yeah. It seems to me that like, you know, I think the, the, the thing that like helps me the most and having lost massive weight and being really unhappy with it. Yeah. Cause if, if I shoot my mind back to 2011, 2012, I was legitimately skinny, like, yeah. um, 212, 200, close to 200 pounds. Um, yeah. uh, and, and felt frail and had lost yeah. so much muscle mass that, um, you know, nobody told me to hyper prioritize lean protein or yeah. do resistance training. I I did see one doctor who was like, you need to start doing dynamic training, like box jumps. And I was, so I went to a CrossFit gym and just yeah. did box jumps and blew my knee out. Right. And, and like, yeah. but that was the advice. I think I understand more what he's saying now, which was I, cause I was doing all cardio then, yeah. which was like, do something else that, you know, is exercises the muscles in a different way. And I get yeah. that, but like resistance training and protein, just figuring yeah. out your protein, whether you're, whether you're vegan or eating animal products, yeah. like if those are valuable datums for anybody to have, especially yeah. if they're going to go on something which reduces their hunger yeah. to the point where they're going to lose 30% of their body weight. Like yeah. knowing that is super valuable. I also think that a lot of people aren't going to care and they're just going to be like, I'm going to continue to live my life and take this drug. And that's, and, and like, but they're going to do that anyways. They've been right. doing fad diets anyways, you know? Right. And so, yeah, it's, you know, you think about, you know, there's like on one end of the spectrum, there's like the, what is it? The almond moms. Um, I, I, can't, I don't know. I, that was a new term for me. I was like, what's an almond mom? Like, yeah. you know, somebody who's already, uh, you know, pretty skinny is going to do the, you know, I need to lose five pounds. Like there's nothing I can do to stop that. Like it's unfortunate and it comes with its own risk of, you know, osteoporosis and like lack of, you know, lean body mass. And like, look, I can't stop everybody from doing things the right way. There's just like this moral high ground of like, you're not doing it the right way. Okay. Susie, Susie down the street is going to be doing whatever she wants. And like, as long as she's not my patient, we're good. Like it's unfortunate, but then you have all these people in this, in America who could really benefit from, you know, these drugs that like, I would never want to like, 
you know, punish them because of something that, you know, you know, Hollywood or, or whatever is deciding to do. Like they're going to do them like they're going to do whatever it takes. And, you know, if you are really that upset, like go talk to the prescribing physician or the Medi spa or whoever is like handing those out like candy. Like I can't stop that. Yeah. But we're not going to shut down this entire thing just because of a couple of bad apples and, you know, kind of doing whatever they want to do. Yeah, but nor should we. I, you know, yeah. I, there was a period in my life where I just wished th that fast food companies would be would go out of business. And that, too, was me, um, you know, insisting that everybody's experience was my experience, mm -hmm. which I've since stopped doing. And like for me, more the most important thing, you know, we're at a time right now where like politics is grosser than it's ever been in my Gosh. lifetime. You know, maybe yeah. when. Yeah. When Reagan got shot, I was a little kid and I don't really remember it, but I maybe it was that, this yeah. ugly then. <laughs> yeah. But like, as far as I can remember, it's just gross. And it's all, and and this is mirrored by like the diet space where it's just like everybody has an expectation that there is a right and a wrong way to mm -hmm. do it. And then they're going to insist that if you're not doing it their way, you're wrong. Right. You know, you know how many times people have come up to me and just gone like, so you, you, you're keto, right? And I'm like, no, I'm not mm -hmm. keto at all. Nope. In fact, I'm going to eat a gigantic bowl of rice for lunch, you know, yeah. and, and my experience is fine. If that's not good for you, then you do you, you know, there's part of me that's like, nothing is stronger than that quote of be the change you want to see in the world. Mm -hmm. It's not insist mm -hmm. everybody else change the way you want them right. to change. And so like, you know, there was a, uh, I, and I'm sure it still exists, but like a growing movement of like regulating sugar and regulating Ouch. processed foods. And it's like, you know, drugs are very regulated in this mm -hmm. country. And yet we have hundreds of thousands or, you know, of specifically fentanyl, I think a hundred thousand people oh, died last year. Yeah. That's not a that's not a drug you can go out and buy. People yeah. are finding a way to consume stuff that's regulated. Yeah. Um, I I don't know that that's that's gonna work. I don't think there's a one size fits all. I do suspect if we abolished processed foods, we would see a reduction in weight. But that's a big cost to like people having autonomy. You know. Yeah, uh, I, I will say the I remember when Philadelphia introduced the sugar tax um, and really what we just started doing was we just bought our and included diet soda into this, ironically enough. Really? Yes. So uh, we would just get go over, hop over the bridge to New Jersey and go once a week and get that and bring it back. So uh, really just didn't do a whole heck of a lot. Um, you know, the. People will pay for what they like. I remember doing, doing, um, volunteering in, in the South and West sides of Chicago and just spending some time and like actually talking to people. So like I would hand out like these like healthy snacks to random kids at a high school. And, you know, the response is like, that tastes, that tastes disgusting. Yeah. I, they're like, I'm not going to, and it's free. And I'm like, it's free. Like you should try. And they're like, ew, I'm not going to eat that. It tastes gross. Raw vegetables don't taste that great. So I, I I'm in the same camp. Like I can't, what am I going to say? Like, yeah, no carrots are great. Like, yes, they're great for you, but they also like raw don't aren't exactly appealing. So it's like, if that's the problem, how are we going to come to the middle of like, you know, and just say like, oh, you're going to get rid of all processed things. I, I don't think that that's really going to do much. They're going to find some other way. They're going to spend that money. They're going to save their money to get, you know, the tasty treats. So uh, I don't necessarily think that, you know, just forcing people to, they'll, they'll find a way to get it. Like yeah, you said. I think so. And, and and I think that, like, it wouldn't have handled. I, it wouldn't have solved my condition. You know, yeah. my my mom. We gr I grew up in a house where processed food was taboo, and I I managed to be an obese kid. It didn't handle. You know, I can overeat brown rice. Yeah, and you know, and meat and olive oil. I can overeat that. I I did overeat that quite a bit. Every diet I ever did, like the blood type diet. 
or even elimination diets, mm -hmm. I would see a little weight loss and then I, it would it very rapidly stall. And I'd be mm -hmm. like, but I didn't eat anything off the list. I'm eating only the things on this list. Right. And I'm still, and then you'd get like, well, it's because you're eating carbohydrates if you cut the carbohydrate. And then <laughs> I would do that and I'd see a little weight loss and then it would stall. And I'd be like, it's still, <sighs> I'm, am I overeating my ribeyes? no that's not possible it must be something <laughs> else you know um so i don't think any of the, that would have saved my life or changed yeah. my life dramatically but um like where do you see this going do you see this going that 70 percent of the country is on these that's a really great question um i think I would probably see the majority of people would be on these. And I think what's really kind of hindering that is a combination of a couple of things. One, I think there's always going to be a huge uh, sector of the population that's just completely skeptical, don't want it and word up like, you know, no big deal. Um, and then also I know there are some, there have been some supply chain issues. I think they've improved. I know that I want to say Eli Lilly um, had opened up a couple of new manufacturing facilities to kind of cope with the, um, with the, uh, supply chain demand. Uh, I believe they were supposed to open up earlier this year. So I think that might have solved some of that, um, some of that. And I haven't really seen too much of a problem with, um, with getting, obtaining the drug, but I will say that, um, I do the, Patients that are on um, the on the drug that I, I work with are pretty um, on top of like, you know, um, if not here, then let's go to this pharmacy. Like they'll scour Reddit sources to see like which pharmacies are like out, which pharmacies are like going to get their, you know, um, going to get their supply. They're calling the pharmacy be like, when is the next shipment? So uh, they're pretty like proactive and like making sure that, you know, it sort of, um, there's always a plan B or a plan C if, you know, their initial pharmacy like has run out. Doesn't so. that, that mm -hmm. has to change. I would think that that, I think, I would think that if that's the trouble we're running into, that that's got to get fixed. I, I mean, that would be my assumption. I would love for that to get fixed. And then, uh, you know, the insurance companies is also just another thing that's like, uh, you know, an eye roll, uh, you know, to have to deal with so far. I haven't seen, I've been thankful that to not run into too many problems of getting these medications, um, you know, uh, covered by insurance. Um, but overall insurance has just been such a terrible, um, <laughs> terrible thing to deal with that it, it's to the point where I, uh, actually recommend to some people, especially when ordering, um, uh, imaging stuff, um, because they're not very upfront about the cost. But if you tell people that you have no insurance, so you ask for the cash pay price, uh, they'll, they have to give it to you. And it's usually much lower than what it would cost with, you know, if you have insurance, which is mind blowing to me, um, how that works. That so. whole system is so fucked. I think we, and, and I say this as a person who just goes through, um, trying to get diabetes meds for my kid mm -hmm. and, you know, she has gadgets on her. She has a, mm -hmm. an insulin pump and a mm -hmm. blood glucose monitor and they somehow communicate with each other yeah. and we have to get one through one company and one through another company. And I will say like, I've talked to people, um, about how they, their experience in Canada with going to see a doctor like you yeah. is a nightmare, Yeah, but, but we were in Canada not long ago to visit a school and she came from the school she was in which is on one coast that i don't live on yeah. and i came and so we met in canada and the first thing she said to me at midnight in canada was dad i forgot insulin and i was like whoa we're only going to be here for a day do you yeah. have enough and she was like no i need to change my pump and so it was like oh, this oh. disaster where i went like well tomorrow we're going to be spent going yeah. to doctors trying to get you insulin this is insane yeah. um and i walked to a pharmacy just to say where's the nearest like emergency clinic that we can yeah. go to and the pharmacist asked me what's going on and i explained and the, the pharmacist said well i can sell you insulin which was insane <laughs> to get it here you need like uh prescriptions in triplicate and, and the pharmacist there said no this is a life-saving medication i can just sell it to you Amazing. and 
not only did they sell us insulin, um, it was like 5% what we pay for it here, even, and they didn't take, they didn't need our insurance information. It was crazy. Yeah. And so like, just the idea that insulin, which does save her life every single day. Yeah is as expensive and hard to get where a few times a year we gear up for our argument with our health insurance, which I'm told as an actor, I have incredible health insurance. And yet I fight with them about this drug that saves my kid's uh, life. It's just, the whole thing is crazy. Yeah, it, it is from both sides of the equation. So then, you know, cause, uh, patients think that, you know, you are like, you know, you're somehow like responsible for what's going on as far as insurance companies go. You're like, no, 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 no. We're on the same team. We're on the same team. I swear. It's just, yeah. When you've got like having to fight the insurance every step of the way for every single patient, for every single medication, boy, does that turn into a whole host of like recipe for burnout for, for physicians. And so, you know, uh, yeah, that's really awesome that, Canada is able to do that and able to kind of, you know, just like, you don't need to go to an ER. Like this is, you know, yeah. <laughs> we just I solved mean, this problem right here. Yeah. Not a lot of people are trying to get their hands on insulin who don't need it. Um, yeah. okay. We covered all these bases. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm super excited. You know, again, I think of bariatric surgery as a tool. Yeah. I think of any diet as a tool. I think of these peptides as a tool. And I think that I'm, I get so happy with people who have had success. And, and I want to tell all the people that think that anybody who's done anything that isn't their way, not the right way to go fuck themselves. And, <laughs> you know, I really do. I'm, I'm just excited that this is something that seems to be really changing lives. And for as far as yeah. insurance companies go, obesity is like such a big part of the drag on our medical industry. I would think that anything that would alleviate that burden would be immediately insured. Yeah, it's really unfortunate that uh, the people, they're not super keen on that. And I get it because they're looking at the short term, like everybody's going to need this drug. So as an insurance company, I need to pay out for these medications. Like I get it, sort of. Um, but yeah, you think about how many hospitalizations, how many complications um, due to diabetes and obesity alone um, has just been, you know, uh, most of the people who are hospitalized, uh, with some sort of complication, like having those two diagnoses on, on your chart just makes it, you know, that much more complicated. Um, I wonder if, you know, uh, when that you think about it like that in terms of hospital costs, um, in terms of, you know, how often they have to go see the doctor, how, how many other medications they're on, um, you know, you start to think, okay, well, yeah, maybe they need, we need to really start thinking about, um, you know, uh, thinking about the long-term effects and being able to keep, you know, maybe we should start having, you know, most of these patients on these medications because these are long-term medications. Uh, these, you know, perfectly fine to be on these medications for, for, you know, forever. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is, this is the other thing with my kid, you know, when we were presented with all of this, I was like, okay, you know, she gets strep throat. She does a course yeah. of antibiotics. Maybe she could do a course of this insulin stuff and be fine. No such luck. This is a forever thing. Unless they figure out a pancreas transplant. Yeah. Um, that's not going to be likely, but I don't, I don't see any reason why something like this wouldn't be the same. If there is a major genetic factor mm -hmm. playing a role in which is hard to understand from people who just are thin naturally, yeah. right? Like, mm -hmm, I don't think mm -hmm. about food. Why don't yeah. you just not think about food? And it's like, okay, right. buddy, well, yeah, <laughs> uh, this is just what I'm thinking about. Not, not intentional. I'm doing my best to think about other stuff. And then I put that chicken breast into my mouth and it's saying, this isn't a fucking cheeseburger, <laughs> you know, um, but there's no reason why it shouldn't be for life. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, there's, uh, you know, some people do feel like it's going to be a temporary thing. And there are studies that show that not a hundred percent of people gain the weight back. So like if you have built up a, an awesome set of habits, you have a plan for the long term, and you feel very strongly about like, you know what, I want to try weaning off these medications, like just give it a shot. Hey, like, you know, more power to you. I, I'm not opposed to that, but you know, I, I, I like to 
under promise and over deliver. So I do tell people the caveat, like, Hey, if you do gain weight, no big deal. That happens pretty commonly with people who come off these medications. Um, and there's always, you know, you can always come back to the medication. No big deal. No judgment. Yeah. yeah. No, I think no judgment is the key in all of this. I think yeah. we should just be celebrating success. Yeah. That's, that's 100%. 100%. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Crystal, thank you so much. This has been an awesome conversation. Oh, thank you so much again for having me.